Hey, uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to present uh, this recent result. Uh, thanks uh, specifically to Daniel, who was kind enough to <laughs> give this opportunity. So this, uh, as the title suggests, uh, it's a new approach which we have developed to study some problems which come under uh, the title strong advection problems. I'll explain what I mean by strong advection problems soon. And uh, this is a joint work with Thomas Holding, who is a postdoc in Imperial, uh, in Warwick now, and uh, Jeffrey Rausch, who is in Michigan. Okay. So let's get straight to the mathematical setting. So we are going to consider advective fields which are divergence free and which have zero normal flux on the boundary in a given domain omega. So it is a prescribed advective field, so we are not going to solve any fluid equations for B. Uh, it's not the unknown here. And B is as smooth as the computation's demand. So we are not trying to optimize regularity on the fluid field here. Okay. And this, we are going to study this Cauchy problem, this initial boundary value problem, for an unknown u epsilon. Epsilon is this parameter here which we use to regulate the strength of the advective field. So when epsilon becomes smaller and smaller, your advective field is of high amplitude. So we want to study the behavior of this family u epsilon. You have a solution u epsilon for each epsilon, so you get a family of solutions. And you want to study what happens when epsilon goes to zero. So in essence, we want to study the effect of ad strong advection on diffusion. So this is a model, a simple model, to study from a scalar quantity which is being uh, spreading in your given domain omega. Okay? Uh, and uh, throughout this talk, uh, the B here, the advective field, it is time independent, so it doesn't depend on time. So as I mentioned in the previous slide. And we impose uh, this uh, zero Neumann condition on the boundary for u epsilon. And uh, I understand that uh, most of the people here talked about oscillations in coefficients. Uh, in this talk, at least, the B will not have any oscillations. So it is just a macroscopic <laughs> advective field. You can have B to have oscillations uh, you can take the advective field B to be like in the standard periodic homogenization case to oscillate with frequency epsilon, okay? Uh, which is B can be locally periodic and it, uh, we can assume that it is divergence free in both these variables. It will simply complicate the analysis but the main difficulty comes from the advective field having a macroscopic behavior in X. So uh, that's why uh, for this talk, I'll simply ignore any microscopic oscillations it might have and just concentrate on a macroscopic advective field B here. Okay? And it will be a soft analysis in the sense that uh, we are happy to obtain some weak limits and characterize the limit points of the family U epsilon. So before we go any further, a little detour. Uh, this advective field B, it's a given quantity, so we can study the kernel of this operator B dot grad. So this is the null space of B dot grad here. And by definition, we are going to consider only regular elements in this in the null space of your given advective field B. Okay? We are going to take only H1 elements which vanish on B dot grad for, every, uh, for almost every X. And this is a closed subspace of the square integrable functions on omega. And then you define this range space of the same operator B dot grad, which is just by definition this one. It's again a subspace of L2 of omega because B is, you know, an L infinity function, so it's fine. 
but omega this w script w here that's not a closed subspace so what you do is you take just take the closure of the script w here and then you use hilbert decomposition theorem to show that this l2 of omega can be decomposed into an element in the null space a direct sum with an element in this closure of the range space okay and once you have this orthogonal decomposition what you can do is uh, for any element in l2 you project it onto either the null space or onto the closure okay so that's what i mentioned here but this minimization aspect of it it's not important for this talk so just see that if you give me any element here what i do is i just project it onto an element on the null space it may so happen that uh, it this null space it's going to depend on what your b is your b may be so bad that it will not have any nice regular elements in the null space except for constants so we are happy with that we will just say that if only constants are allowed we we say that okay that's fine and this has some very nice connection to a result which was published in 2008 by constantin and coauthors where they characterized uh for the same equation where they asked this particular problem are there fluid fields b which lead to enhanced relaxation we know that this is a a uh, parabolic problem and in the long time limit you tend to you know u epsilon in the long time limit it will go to the the initial mass you know in l2 for example limit t going to infinity but they wanted to know if there were any fluid fields b which enhance this relaxation you need not wait for long times you can just pick any arbitrary time tau for example and then you can pick epsilon small enough such that this is zero okay and uh, they characterized the fluid fields b telling that if you take this null space n and if it has only constants in it then those are the only fluid fields which result in this enhanced relaxation so this was a very big result which was published in 2008 so we will see that this has our results will mm, recover their result which was done in a very uh, complicated manner and their result was published in annals of mathematics by the way and we recover that result in a very simpler functional analytic approach okay so we have this problem here so this is just standard a priori estimates i just recall so we have is equal to zero and as i mentioned we want to know what is the limit point of this family u epsilon so this is standard approach you get a priori estimates which are uniform in this parameter epsilon and then you just use weak compactness okay so this straight away follows you have this limit point u bar and this weak limit in l2 so then you go to the weak formulation of your problem here i just written the weak formulation of this parabolic problem here and we have we know how to pass to the limits in all the terms except for the problematic term which is the main difficulty in this problem which has a 1 over epsilon term next to it so what you do is you just multiply by epsilon all through because in the limit all other terms are of order 1 so if you multiply this entire expression by epsilon you just get that b dot grad, grad u bar tested against c is 0 integrated over time space so that just says that for almost every time t your u bar is in the kernel of b that was the definition okay so and that you get for free we are not doing anything so okay we get that whatever this limit point u bar is it's in the kernel for almost every time t okay so but then 
once you gather that information, now you know that where your limit point u bar lies, so you restrict your test functions to belong to this null space. So what we are going to do is, we are going to take test functions psi such that psi for every time t belongs to the null space. And uh, there I should also mention that the time derivative of psi, because the test functions is in our hands, so you can take the test time derivative of psi to belong to the null space as well, but anyway. So, essentially what, if you take psi to be in the null space, you know, by definition, b dot gradient of u epsilon is in the range space. And we showed that there is L2 decomposition, orthogonal decomposition, so this term vanishes. So the problematic 1 over epsilon term doesn't stay. If you restrict your test function c to belong to the null space for every time t. So this term goes away and you'll be left with all nice terms and there you can just use the weak compactness in L2 which you had and pass to the limit. But this condition here, you know, this is like a constraint we have obtained. And this is like the divergence free condition, if you may, in the incompressible fluid dynamics. And here, this is a constraint, so you get a Lagrange multiplier. Uh, so you can put any, for this variational formulation, I can add on the right hand side some term which belongs to this W bar. And since I'm taking test functions restricted to the null space, this will always be zero. So when you read out the associated PDE, this F will be like the associated Lagrange multiplier for your constraint that your limit point is in the null space. So for that, you know, you in the limit you get this weak formulation for U bar and you read out that U bar should satisfy this problem. That for every time T it should be in the null space and time derivative of U bar minus the Laplacian of U bar should belong to the range space, or more specifically, the orthogonal complement of the null space. And uh, this is another very important point. If you go back to this expression, which had the initial condition here, if you restrict C to B in the null space, in the, you know, you just pick up the only, the projected part of the initial condition, which was in the null space. So that is what we mentioned here. So the limit point u bar will, its initial condition, if you may, sh will be the projected initial condition of your original initial condition. So for the rest of the analysis, this will pose any, f uh, this will pose the problem because if you wish to prove that we have for free from the weak compactness that this goes to u bar weakly in L2. But if we want to show that this actually goes strongly in L2 in time and space, any hope of doing that will be hindered by the fact that this u bar close to time t is equal to zero is starting at a different initial condition compared to what u epsilon begins with. So there's, you cannot straight away improve the previous weak uh, convergence you had to this strong convergence. So I'll explain, but this is one hurdle, by the way. So before we go any further, when we got those weak limits, we always say that, okay, you, this is always up to extraction of subsequences. So if your limit problem here if it is well posed, then your entire sequence converges. So that's what we show here. But restricted to these spaces, in that energy space, so that's very important. If you give me an initial condition, then there exists a unique solution to that problem in this energy space. Okay, this is just standard energy estimates and Galerkin approximation. And so, this is what I was trying to mention earlier. So the entire sequence converges, but this is what we have proved thus far, that the difference u epsilon minus u bar tested against an L2 function goes to zero, okay? It's only a weak type of convergence. And thus far, we have only used the fact that 
B is divergence free and it has zero uh, normal flux. And furthermore, I mean, I have not mentioned here that, uh, you know, if B has only constants in this kernel, then U bar does not solve any of that limit equation there. Okay, so that is another point, but it will become clear later on. So this is the question we want to answer. Are there fluid fields B which improve the weak convergence to a strong convergence in L2? Okay, can we characterize them? I already mentioned that one obstacle is that the initial condition has changed for U, epsilon, U bar. So I mentioned that. So the whatever we have, I showed you until now, that anybody can do. I mean, just L2, H1, if they are aware of it, they can study those things. So we published a result. Uh, this is in the current uh, issue of SIAM, Journal of Math Analysis, where our strategy is to study this problem in a moving frame of reference rather than in a fixed frame, and then study compactness properties. So, and then there is the second part, which is in preparation, I will mention later. Okay, so to the first part. Our strategy is, we are given this advective field B, we will take the flow associated with that fluid field B. Okay, so you start a little x, then you run this ODE. Then, once you have a flow phi of tau, you can define this Jacobian matrix, okay, which is just its definition. And the main point is, if your advective field B is incompressible, then your flow is volume preserving. So if you compute the determinant of this Jacobian, then it's one, okay? So I mentioned that we want to study this problem, advection diffusion problem, in a moving coordinate. So, you see, this is just the standard energy, which you, you just multiply this equation by u epsilon and integrate over omega, you get this expression here. Okay, this is uh, equal to zero, which I not mentioned there. Because B is divergence free, the strong advection term doesn't contribute to the energy. Okay? And in, the, and in this term here, if you replace u epsilon, if you make this change of variable, x going to phi of t over epsilon x. This is the flow which we defined in the previous slide. Okay, so then you, uh, you pick up these Jacobians because you are differentiating in x, this function u epsilon, but then you are making the change of variable, so you get this. This is the flow variable, if you may. Okay, you are differentiating this variable. Then you pick up this Jacobian matrices, which depend on, you know, if you differentiate this flow at a given time tau there, then your Jacobian depends on the tau variable. And we are taking tau to be t over epsilon, so this is the new variable, which we call fast time variable, which we introduce and we study. Okay, so similarly you get this. The main point is, because we are working with di divergence-free fluid fields, Whenever you make this particular change of variables, you don't pick up this Jacobians in the integrals because this is always one. Okay, it's volume preserving. So that's one nice thing about it. So instead of studying U epsilon evaluated at T of X, we study the problem for this unknown, U epsilon evaluated at T, phi T over epsilon of X. And this fellow will solve this problem. It's in Lagrangian coordinates, but it will solve, you know, because you are moving along the flow, it will eat up this one over epsilon term, and you will be left with this one. But what we have done is we have introduced this new coefficients here, which are depending on this variable t over epsilon, and we don't know how they behave when epsilon goes to zero. So here comes um, a series of assumptions we are going to make about the Jacobian matrix, okay? Which in turn is an assumption on the advective field B, okay? 
because Jacobian is the Jacobian of the flow of the field. Okay, before we go into what are the assumptions on the Jacobian matrix, this is a, s a little detour into von Neumann's uh, uniform ergodic theorem, which says that, okay, if you take a separable Hilbert space and a one parameter family of transformations, and if you have a projection which, you know, if you apply the one parameter group, the V doesn't change, then if you integrate, if you take this long time average, then it's just the projection of your element. Okay. Why we need this? Because this is another interpretation of that operator, which was the projection operator we had. You know, we had this decomposition into null space direct sum, this one. Then P was L2 omega into the null space. In fact, using this ergodic theorem, we can say that this projection of an element f is nothing but you evaluate your uh, function f along the flow and you integrate between minus t and t and divide by 1 over t and take the long time average. Okay? So this just follows by the ergodic theorem, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so now let's get to this. Uh, what are the assumptions on the Jacobian matrix? You know, the Jacobian matrix was, uh, which we got, looked like T over epsilon X. So we want to understand how this function J behaves as epsilon goes to zero. So there are these objects which are called algebra with mean value, which essentially say that if you give me an element in that algebra with mean value, whatever this abstract object is, if you scale your variable, as t over epsilon, for example, which is exactly in our case, then if you let epsilon goes to zero, it has a L infinity weak star limit. It goes to some constant, which depends on your function f. So this is exactly what we need. So we are going to assume that the Jacobian matrix of our fluid field B belongs to certain algebra with mean value. I'll give some examples of an algebra with mean value later, but this is the abstract uh, def, uh, like assumption we are going to make that we can treat fluid fields B which have a Jacobian matrix belonging to certain algebra with mean value. Okay? Uh, this is a little computation with change of variables again, which just says that if you give, if you know that F has a mean value M of F when you scale the variable, then it should match with whatever this long time average is. So if there is a M of F, this mean value, which was this abstract quantity, if it exists, it should match with this one. So this is more intuitive rather than this abstract L infinity weak star limit. Okay? So we'll just keep this in mind that, uh, you know, by this observation, it just says that my fluid field B is such that if I evaluate this Jacobian matrix J, and compute this quantity, it is constant, okay? And it exists, it's finite, so that's one. Okay, then, okay, so here, you know, this is, even though this gives an intuitive idea of what this mean value of J is, it is not good for doing analysis in the sense that you are integrating over non-compact object, which is the real line, okay? So you will not be able to uh, use any compactness properties. So for that, people have worked on this to give alternate interpretation of this mean value. Whenever they exist, are they equal to something where you integrate over a compact space? For that, they use something called spectrum of a Banach algebra, which I will skip. Okay, they use some abstract objects here, but essentially, the main thing is this one that if whenever a mean value exists, it should be integrated over certain compact space where this u hat is not the Fourier transform, it's the something called the Gelfand transform with against some radon measure. What specifically what they are is not important to us, but 
uh, the point I was making about integrating over non-compact domains is remedied in this result of N. Guatseng. So he is the same guy who did the two-scale theory in the late 80s, uh, two-scale conversion. So he has developed this notion of homogenization structures around 2003-2004 where he actually proved that if you give me an algebra with mean value and if there is an element u which has a mean value m of u, it should be this integral. This is very useful when we try to prove certain compactness properties. Okay, uh, it's all well and good, but uh, are there, what are the examples of certain algebra with mean value? So this is uh, one example of periodic functions. They form a class of algebra with mean value. Then if you take continuous functions which converge at infinity, okay, then they form an algebra with mean value. And another classical example is this almost periodic functions. They form a, uh, an algebra with mean value. So, you know, there are very many definitions of almost periodic functions. Uh, this is due to Bohr, where you take the linear, finite linear combinations of cos and sine, and then if you give me an element u, and if I can find g in this set, which will approximate in L infinity norm to whatever error you give me, then you say that it belongs to an al al it's an almost periodic function. So just that, okay, this is the standard typical example which one would write for an almost periodic function. So you just mismatch, like you put a rational period there so that it uh, it's never periodic, but it's almost periodic, so just that. And then there's a notion of ergodicity, which I'll skip. Okay, so here is the strategy. I mentioned that we want to study, rather than the family in a fixed frame, we are going to study the family U epsilon in the moving frame. But this is the main assumption we make, that I fix an, uh, mm, an abstract algebra with mean value A. You know, we can pick one of those examples which I gave earlier. So that the Jacobian matrix as a function of this fast time variable tau belongs to that algebra with mean value. Just that. But, um, you know, in one of the slides where I gave the definition of an algebra with mean value, the main point was this algebra with mean value are a subalgebra of bounded continuous functions. So, for any element in an algebra with mean value, it should be a bounded function of that variable where you are doing the oscillation. So, this is one main restriction we are going to put on the field that the Jacobian matrix as a function of tau. You know, you, when you say that Jacobian matrix as a function of tau belongs to A, it essentially says that it's a bounded function of tau. Okay, so now, then, uh, for those of you who have seen two scale convergence, this looks familiar, except for the fact that there is this flow which is given here. So we give this notion of conver multi scale convergence where we pick a family u epsilon, which is in L2, okay? Then you multiply by test functions. But in this variable, in the second variable, you move your frame in the backward direction because you want to study u epsilon in the forward direction. So then you just put the test functions in the backward direction so that when you make a change of variables, you are exactly where you want. But then you introduce this new variable t over epsilon, which is essentially what the two scale people did. Okay, so we have given the name sigma convergence because without this flow, uh, N. Guatseng gave the same name for what he did for homogenization structure. So to keep the, uh, so we have fixed the same name here. So essentially the main point is this one, that you fix an algebra with mean value A and you take a flow, then you pick test functions in the moving coordinate, when you test against some family u epsilon here, it should go to this triple integral where you get this. If your algebra with mean value is a periodic, is the space of periodic functions, then this delta of A is the period, which was in the example which I gave. And you recover the standard two scale convergence with drift, which people did. Okay. And then we prove that this definition is not an empty definition in the sense that if you give me a uniformly bounded sequence in L2 in time and space, 
I can extract subsequences and there is a limit in the sense which we have. Okay, then I give the proof which I'll skip now. Okay, this is the main result the f uh, for the first part, which says that if my Jacobian matrix of the given advective field B belongs to certain algebra with mean value, then I can use this new notion of convergence to get a limit point for U epsilon in that topology, U naught, and gradient goes to some product here. You see, it involves the Jacobian. And then U naught satisfies this diffusion equation. And you observe that this D of X, this diffusion matrix is J, J transpose integrated over the delta of A. But we saw that whenever this is finite, that means that the mean value of this product exists. And whenever that mean value exists, then that should be that long time average. So the physical intuition of this quantity here is, you know, he, the, we took the identity to be the diffusion coefficient here. And what we are saying is this effective diffusion is nothing but you take limit t going to infinity, 1 over 2t minus t to t of this j j transpose evaluated all along your flow. What you do is you evaluate what this product is along your flow lines and you cumulatively you consider. And that is the interpretation of what this diffusion matrix D here. Okay, well and good. Uh, so the main assumption we made was the Jacobian matrix belongs to a certain algebra with mean value. So are there advective fields which yield the Jacobian matrix belonging to certain algebra with mean value? Here are some examples. So the first one is the constant drift, which is standard. Okay? Because if you compute the Jacobian there, it's identity. So that is in any algebra you want. And then this asymptotically constant drift. So this you can cook up. What essentially this definition says is, say we are in 2D, okay? I fix minus R and R. I'll allow my flow lines to be constant in outside minus R and R. And in between, they are non-constant, but None of this integral curves, you know, any particle starting here, it will not spend eternity inside this patch. It has to go out. So there's a uniform exit time where everybody is in the nice regions where you are constant. So that is what we mean by asymptotically constant drift. Okay. But then there is a large class of uh, divergence-free advective fields which give Jacobian matrix which do not grow in tau. And that is this Euclidean motions. Euclidean motions are nothing but rotations and translations. So any Euclidean motion can be written as A acting on X plus a constant vector B bar, where A is a skew symmetric matrix. So any Euclidean motion can be written like this. And if you compute its associated flow, it's just this one. And um, here the Jacobian is orthogonal matrix. Most point is that, uh, important point is that it doesn't grow in tau. Okay, I'll give an example here. So this is an example of an Euclidean motion in a ball, B01. Okay, we are not giving the translation, translation is zero, but it is rotating in your domain, ball of radius one. And you just do the simple computation which you do in undergraduate level. So this is the flow, you solve the second order ODE. You know, this essentially boils down to, if you explicitly know what the advective field is, you have to just compute the flow and the associated Jacobian matrix to know what the growth is. And you get this Jacobian matrix, which is the rotation matrix, by the way. And this is what you expect because the fluid field is rotating. And these fellows, they never grow. And this particular expression, it says that what will be the choice of my algebra with mean value? Because these are all periodic functions, I can pick my algebra with mean value to be these periodic functions. Okay? And also, it, it's 
it doesn't grow so that's very important um, this new notion of convergence it was again a weak notion of convergence we were multiplying by test functions we can actually improve this we can actually show that it is a strong kind of convergence in this sense for any given time t if you take u epsilon and u naught u epsilon is in the fixed coordinate but u naught is in this moving coordinate going backwards like this then this l2 norm goes to zero when epsilon goes to zero and uh, you know yeah if you want to j you just make a change of variable here x going to forward along the flow for the same amount of time t or epsilon then you get this and this is what we wanted to say something about and it goes to if you redefine this as w epsilon then there is this family w epsilon which goes to u naught strongly in l2 in omega but for any time t so that is there so and u naught you know it was satisfying a diffusion equation so even though we were doing all this analysis up to extraction of subsequence since the limit is limit problem is again well posed this is a f uh, the entire sequence converge so then you might ask like okay you show two results where u epsilon t of x goes to some u bar which was this constraint problem where we said that u bar belongs to the kernel the entire sequence converges there weakly and here we are saying that okay th there is this new sequence w epsilon which goes to u not strongly here so is there some kind of is u not and u bar related there is no contradiction because essentially because of this reason because they are not the same families even though you use u epsilon but your reference frame is different so it's essentially a different sequence of functions okay so that's what i i here i just did a summary of what we have seen so far and this is what i say that um, u epsilon weakly converges to u bar for any fluid field b but w epsilon goes to u not strongly but w epsilon is not the same as u epsilon it is u epsilon taken along moving frames so there is no contradiction here okay so in uh, i think how much time do i have in another 10 minutes i guess yeah so this is the second part i'll rush here um if this is the simple incompressible fluid field which one can write okay in 2d and for this if we compute the flow and the associated jacobian matrix you get this growth here it grows in tau and so this does not belong to any algebra with mean value so you will not be able to get the its mean value and this in fluid mechanics people call this lagrangian stretching and the main difficulty for our analysis is this one that the mean value doesn't exist for this jacobian this is one example where you get unbounded jacobians and you know in the diffusion matrix we ha in the limit diffusion we essentially were supposed to pass to the limit jj transpose so let us just compute we don't know what the limit is but let's just compute what jj transpose is you get this expression here so there is a quadratic growth in tau so our idea is fairly simple what we are going to say is okay this is the quantity where we want to understand to see how the diffusion is happening in the limit so let's multiply by this may look a kind of artificial but it will become clear so we are going to multiply by some function of tau which will remedy this problem we have that they don't go to some limit that they don't have mean value in the long time average so for at least for this particular example you know you can multiply okay, i think i'll mention here if i just divide by 1 plus tau square it will take care of this growth here but it will do one bad thing that it will kill everybody else it will make these fellows zero uh, but that is something which is expected i'll mention that okay so if you multiply by a weight function omega tau then such that uh, this is we are trying to once you know what the jacobian matrix is and how it grows in tau you can always cook up these functions you can search for these weight functions which will remedy the growth 
so that you get some mean value. But the limit, you know, in the limit you lose rank. Even though you start with full rank in the diffusion here, you are diffusing in every direction, and here you start diffusing in only one direction. Okay, only along x1. And that, you know, in the shear flow example, that x1 is the direction of your flow. So that you just keep in mind. So I just do the computation this long time average, but this is just this one. This is what you get in the limit. Okay. So we cannot simply multiply by the omega square here. It should come from your equation. So for this, you need to do another change of variable. So what we do is we introduce a new uh, time variable, script t, okay, so that when, okay, this is the Jacobian for that change of variable, d script t over dt, essentially gives out 1 over omega square, which you can push it to the right hand side and it will remedy the growth here. But see that you, when you solve this ODE, which I think I wrote here, okay, when epsilon becomes smaller and smaller, this little t, which is the observation time scale, looks like this one, epsilon to the two thirds. So that's why we gave a name to this script t, which is the new time variable we are introducing. We called it boundary layer time scale. So whatever phenomena is happening here, it is happening very quickly. Okay? It's happening before we realize it. So uh, if you just do this in our particular example, we get this equation, which is a diffusion only in x1 direction, but in the script t variable. Okay, if I, I'll skip this. This is just another multi-scale thing. But essentially the point is this. In this another new notion of convergence, you will get a limit which depends on the script t variable, which is a boundary layer time variable. In that, you satisfy this diffusion equation. This looks abstract because it doesn't show that you have lost rank here. But if you work with a specific example, you'll see that you lose rank. It's not a, it's a degenerate diffusion when compared to your previous one. Okay. So let's go back to this one. Uh, this is to understand what's happening physically. So this is in the time boundary layer. This is a 1D diffusion problem with your starting initial datum. You know, diffusion, it tends to equilibrate. So when script t goes to infinity, you go to its average along where you are diffusing, in x1, for example. And that is essentially what the projection is in the shear flow case. In AX2, 0. Okay, so for this one, if you take any function of x2, okay, because you want to solve the null space of this operator, any function of x2 is in the null space of this shear flow for this example. So you, you essentially go to the projected initial data, which just depends on x2. And these are just some arguments. but. The main point is this, that when script t goes to infinity, you relax very quickly along the flow to belong to the null space n. And once you reach the null space, you run your u bar, which was there, which was the first thing we did using. Then it will pick up that initial data which, spit, which was spit out by the script t dynamics which happens, you know, script t going to infinity is happening in the time boundary layer t is equal to zero. So whatever is happening here is happening only here. It will just project the given initial data into the null space and then this dynamics will pick up and it will start diffusing. But it will start diffusing only orthogonal to your flow lines. Okay, and this is not something specific to shear flows. This is specific to any 2D Hamiltonian flows. 
uh, provided Hamiltonian is not degenerate, which I don't have time to explain here. We essentially say that we can always cook up this time variable script T such that you get enhanced relaxation onto the null space and then you get diffusion along orthogonal flow lines. And this is essentially that. But because thanks to this dynamics in script T variable and the little t variable, you will be able to prove the strong convergence which we were looking for, for this constraint problem. Okay? I don't have time for this, I'll skip this. Okay, so we need to understand what is this problem here? Okay, this is the constraint problem which we obtained earlier. So, what essentially is happening? Okay, in this case, we understood what it is. Like, if you had a shear flow, okay, it becomes constant along these fellows, then it starts diffusing, it starts jumping these flow lines in the order one time scale. So that is the interpretation of u bar, the equation for u bar. Uh, let's say we take this, uh, this is a very famous example of cellular flows. Okay, I, yeah, so this is the f uh, streamlines of this flow. So what essentially we are saying is, okay, if you begin here, you start jumping level sets, and this is a stationary point, and then you bounce back. And when you hit these lines, which are the separatrices, you just pick another cell randomly, then you start diffusing in that cell. So this is what Friedlin and Wenzel did in their theory of dynamical systems for Hamiltonian fields. And this we recover from our functional analytic expression. And this is what I explain here. I don't have time. Okay. And these are some, uh-oh. I was talking to my parents when I took the screenshot. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is another uh, example of uh, something called cat's eye flow. Okay? And um, our analysis works for these examples as well. This one. And, oh, by the way, this I took the screenshot of uh, a paper by Papa Nicolaou. That's why this one. Okay, I have not plotted it, I should admit. And then there is this ABC flows, which are very popular. And uh, then if you take C is equal to zero, this specific example, then it kind of decouples. This is very good. And uh, then you do the analysis. All our analysis works well for all these examples. I don't have time to this. But this problem has attracted a lot of attention. Okay, and there are quite... Uh, large amount of activity which has been happening since 85, 1985. And uh, here are some references. And if you want to know more about the proofs in all these results, I would be happy to discuss. Okay. Thank you very much.